They were here thousands of years before Columbus. While Paris was still a village, they were carving cities out of the jungle. They played a ball game for life or death. They planned their lives according to the heavens. Their writing is a puzzle we're still learning to decipher. Wow, look at this. Really something. Now the pace of discovery is quickening. We are finally finding out who they were. Bone? There's a lot of bone. Uh, look at this. Ooh, man. man. Look, it's a, it's a black kind of... Oh, man. Oh, man. This is really a powerful work of art. They are the people who say that the gods made them from corn. They are the Maya. The year is 1839. The place, Western Honduras. An American explorer named John Lloyd Stevens is leading an expedition in search of an abandoned Maya city called Copan. Almost nothing is known about the Maya. Stevens is about to learn more. Draped with a thousand years of tropical growth, the brooding temples and tumbled stone sprawl for miles. Stevens is overwhelmed by a sense of mystery. Who built this place? What happened here? In the following days, Stevens and English artist Frederick Catherwood record their impressions of the ruined city. It lay before us like a shattered bark in the midst of the ocean. Her masts gone, her crew perished, and none to tell whence she came, or what caused her destruction. All was mystery. Dark, impenetrable mystery. During the next three years, Stevens and Cather would visit the better-known Maya sites to the north. In Yucatan, they explore Uxmal and Chichen Itza. In Chiapas, they visit Palenque. And still, questions plague them. Who built these cities? Why had they been abandoned? The land of the Maya spread from parts of Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala in the south, to Belize and Mexico in the north. It was dotted with hundreds of small kingdoms, each with its own unique history. The heartland of what scholars call the classic Maya civilization lay in the southern lowlands. It is there that our story takes place, starting at the site where scientific excavations first began, 
Michael Pan. Today, this partially restored site still retains its air of mystery. Bill Fash is the director of the Copan Acropolis Project. Copan was one of the premier Maya cities. Now, we can't say that in terms of its size. Certainly, there were other cities that were larger. But while it was booming for about 400 years there, it was quite a place. It had incredible artists, sculptors, architects, engineers, astronomers, scribes, and so forth. So I suppose if you had to put it in our cultural terms, if Tikal were like, say, New York, Copan was like Paris. Every year for the past few decades, a handful of Maya specialists and hundreds of workers have been trying to piece Copan's history back together. The story of what happened here is still unfolding, stone by stone. There are over 30,000 fragments of stone sculpture that once adorned these buildings. The problem is, for this particular puzzle, there's no box top. There's no picture that enables us to know how they went back together. We have to try and figure that out. And the problem's made worse by things like this. This is what we call a gawk pile, G-O-K for God only knows, because God only knows where any of these rocks came from. The earlier archaeologists just piled them up here. So our job is to figure out which designs adorn the different structures. Come back to the gawk piles and pull out the examples that are just like those we have dug up and try and put the whole thing back together. But in spite of the difficulties, Fash's team of experts has reassembled thousands of sculptures and conserved dozens of buildings. Every year, the picture of what Copan was like more than a thousand years ago becomes clearer. Many clues still lie hidden in the temples where the Maya elite buried their dead. The classic Maya had virtually no interest in metal, so there is no gold buried here. But sometimes, something even more valuable is unearthed. That's it. Watch the wire. There you Can go. I see this space? All oh, right, yes. It's repainted. It's a stucco coating over... In 1992, Robert Scherer discovered the tomb of a royal family member. Buried with him were some pots. One glyph is there. What the makes these vessels there. especially significant are the painted designs and the hieroglyphic writing. Well, they're fantastic vessels, although I don't know if I can say much about the glyphs on them. The Forty years ago, we could read only a few Maya hieroglyphs. Today, we can read about half, but it takes an expert. There's another pot just like the, just like the one with one, the feet huh? in, the, in the tomb. Wow. But the, again, that's just a... David Stewart is the son of Maya scholars, and one of the world's foremost epigraphers. By being able to read the glyphs now, it makes the Maya a little bit more normal. It uh, makes them more human, because we see that they did have history, that they were people that had real uh, concerns about themselves and uh, the events in their lives. One kind of Maya writing was almost lost forever. When Spanish priests arrived in the 16th century, they found hundreds of folding books called codices and promptly burned them. Today, only parts of four codices remain, but they have helped to shape the way we think about the Maya. The books are almanacs, filled with astrological information.
The men and women who wrote the almanacs were scribes, well versed in astronomy. Using a sophisticated mathematics, they calculated the movements of the night sky thousands of years into the past and thousands of years into the future. They knew that the universe moved in cycles, some very large, some very small. They even predicted eclipses of the sun. They seemed to have been fascinated by the relationship between time and the events in their own lives. The Maya also left a record in a medium much more permanent than paper. And this writing contains much more than dates and numbers. On these stones, the Maya recorded the important events in the lives of their rulers. This is the hieroglyphic stairway at Copan, the longest inscribed text in the New World. But early archaeologists reassembled it out of order, so today we can read it only in segments. Sculpture specialist Barbara Fash is making a catalog of the 1,200 glyphs on the stairway. Someday, these drawings may tell a more complete story of Copan's kings. This means to plant with a stick in the ground. Other so hieroglyphs ideas, are more accessible, thanks to dramatic breakthroughs in the past few decades. This is the date. It's, uh, Epigrapher Linda Sheely has done her share of the recent detective cool. work. This is a little tree, Te, and on this side, facing the east, he's young. But on the west side, you can see, look at the beard. It is a rare thing when a people develop historical consciousness and make recorded history a part of what they do. What we are participating in now is the recovery of lost history because American history does not begin in 1492 with Columbus. It begins in 200 B.C. with the first Maya king who wrote his name on a stone. Long before the first king wrote his name on a stone, the Maya were living in the fertile Copan Valley. They were corn farmers, their lives were ruled by the rhythms of the natural world, planting and harvesting, birth and death. But around A.D. 400, at about the time Rome was starting to collapse, a change swept through the valley. On a lazy bend in the Copan River, Buildings made from stone were rising from the jungle floor. For farmers accustomed to village life, the city must have been a revelation. Brilliantly colored buildings surrounded a whitewashed central plaza where thousands of people could gather. There was trade in shells and cacao beans, tobacco, jade, and feathers. At the center of the city stood the ball court. The object of the ball game seems to have been to keep the heavy rubber ball in motion without using hands or feet. Stone carvings at some sites show ball players with severed human heads dangling from their belts. But no one knows if they depict what actually happened to the losers or illustrate something more symbolic. The 
the ball was supposed to be a metaphor for the movement of the sun and by extension also the moon and the stars and you wanted to make sure that there was regularity in that movement they thought that if they played the game in the right way and honored the gods in the right way that they would ensure the agricultural cycle and enable the sun to rise and the rains to come on time and for there to be a bountiful harvest In the sacred world of the Maya, the gods were the source of all life, and only the kings had the power to intervene with them. The gods sustained the physical universe with sun and rain, and expected humans to nourish them in return. The supreme source of that nourishment was blood. When the Maya wanted to acknowledge the sacredness of the moment or an important event they would let blood blood was the vehicle that carried a quality that they called tulel which means their soul it was something that not only permeated human bodies it permeated buildings it permeated the trees the sky it permeated all things sacred in the world and when they gave blood what they were doing was they were activating the chulal it's like george lucas is the force if you can think of obi-wan kenobi you know calling the force out or luke as he guides the plane in you know uh, in in the final death star battle that's what the mai were doing by these rituals is they were touching what they considered to be the living force of the universe and it's still here On special occasions, the king himself would give blood. This was one of the most sacred rituals in Maya life. After days of fasting and spiritual preparation, the king would pierce his foreskin with a stingray spine and let the blood drip onto paper strips. With this act of sacrifice, a doorway to the gods was opened. When the paper strips were burned, the Maya believed they could see their gods in the rising smoke. Today, the descendants of the ancient Maya still live much like their ancestors did. The myths they remember and the ceremonies they perform are all part of a tradition that the Maya say God gave them at the beginning of time. <laughs> Casimiro Sagahau is a Maya priest who blesses the fields at harvest time. We are Kachikeles, direct descendants of the ancient Maya. Our religion is from a long time ago. I learned as a child from the Maya priest. In dreams, we learned from the Maya gods when to plant and when to harvest, when to set the fires, and when to do the corn ceremony. The Maya passion for ritual was one of the first things Spanish missionaries observed when they arrived in Yucatan almost 500 years ago. 
hari ini saya berbual di Muntama Kecang Tali Jangan Kecang Jusya Sikit Mudah Tidak 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 When the Catholic Church banned traditional forms of worship, the old ways went underground. Today, the religion the Maya follow is a blend of these two ancient faiths. The Maya have clung tenaciously to many aspects of the old culture. In the highlands of Chiapas and Guatemala, their unique dress not only defines them as Maya, but identifies the particular village where they live. It is said that when a Maya woman puts on her traditional blouse, called a wipil, her head emerges at the very center of a world, woven from dreams, just as the great tree of life emerges from the earth. I learned to weave when I was very small. I watched how my mother was weaving, and I made a little loom myself. Then I dreamed that I bought red yarn and black yarn too. It came to my heart how to weave a brocade, how to weave the wipil. It came to my heart in a dream. In the highlands of Chiapas, Mexico, Chip Morris has been working with weavers for 20 years. The weavers have always said that their designs come from the beginning of the world, meaning the beginning of their culture. When I started looking at the archaeology of the sculptures and the statues, the things that show what the weaving was like, there are a number that are all but identical to the weavings of today. What's in the designs is a map of the Maya world, but not the surface of the earth, not where we are standing now, but it's the dream world. It's that world where the gods are, where the, the beings that control rain, where Angel, the lightning boat, lives. There are no trucks, there are no houses on a, on a blouse. It's all images of that sacred universe that creates rain, that creates life, that maintains the world. In a world where the line between the secular and the sacred is almost imperceptible, everything is more than it seems. Pyramids symbolize sacred mountains where the ancestors dwell. Doors represent the mouths of caves, passageways into the mountain's dangerous underworld. The Maya believed they went to that underworld when they died. They called it Shibalba. It was the place of fright, a watery realm of disease and decay that ordinary people had little hope of escaping. How the Maya treated their dead is being investigated here, at a site 130 miles north of Copan. These are the ruins of a city called Caracol. Once, it was a prosperous administrative center. Today, it is remarkable for the scores of tombs discovered here. I think we leave the rest of this to remove the rocks. Okay. okay. Arlen Chase is a pottery expert. Diane Chase is an authority on human bones. They're trying to understand how the Maya thought about death. 
We tend to think of things in westernized terms. The Maya were not a western society. They didn't do anything the way that Europeans do. It's so hard for our own society to understand how the Maya lived. I mean, we don't have dead living with us, you know, every day. We don't put them in a room in our house and maintain them there. Well, the Maya essentially did that in their living groups. Okay. Oh, this is nice, Alan. This is real nice. We've definitely got a royal tomb here. Ordinary people were usually buried under the floors of their houses. But the vessels are nice and they're in good shape. The elite were placed in tombs. This polychrome over here um, is in better shape on the back than the front side. What about the bone? Bone? There's a lot of bone. There are uh, at least two individuals whose heads are to the south. They're in pretty good shape. You know, someone else's legs are up in this corner. It doesn't go with either one of the first two individuals. It's not the, the man and the, the possible woman. It's somebody different. It wasn't uncommon for the Maya to bury more than one family member in the same space. I like to think of it more like a, um, a family mausoleum, where grandpa may have died, and you place him inside first. Uh, grandma dies, you put her inside too. Uh, a number of years pass, and um, maybe the son or daughter dies. You might move grandpa to the side a little bit, uh, grandma too, and stick the son in. Um, and a little bit further along, a few more people in the family die, and eventually the mausoleum has quite a lot of bone material inside. Um, this one's got a ring For archaeologists, tombs are like time capsules. The objects buried with the dead sometimes yield precise dates and names. I can't see what the design is, but it's got those bones on it. These help to fill out our picture of how the ancient Maya lived. the lab should pop out. And sometimes what they find is simply beautiful. Like the tombs at Caracol, the buildings of Copan contain their share of buried history. But finding it has often been an elusive undertaking. Honduran archaeologist Ricardo Agurcia has been working at Copan since 1978. My primary interest was finding out what happened to these people. It's something that's part of my heritage, too. It's something that's part of my country. And I grew up, I mean, I wasn't very young when I came to these ruins the first time, but uh, it impacted me. And it was a fascinating issue, a question that you were always thinking about. What happened to these people? Who were they? How did they do the things they did? For the past four years, Agurcia has been excavating a temple pyramid that may tell us more about how how the people of Copan lived. Temple 16 is a typical royal structure in terms of its construction, and therein lies the archaeologist's challenge. For the Maya, certain spaces were sacred, so they built their temples one on top of another. Workers would collapse the upper levels of an existing structure, encase what was left with heavy fill, and build a new structure around it. As Agurcia's crew remove the fill, they create a labyrinth of tunnels. Working in tunnels, it tends to be very confusing. You're working like in three dimensions, you know, you're going up, down, sideways, in between. And oftentimes you get lost, and you know, can't really understand what you're looking at. The flat wall on the left used to be the outer wall of an older temple. Only by following its walls to their ends can Agurcia determine the building's original dimensions. I only traveled a short distance, and bingo, we hit another wall. It still goes farther off towards the south. So we then tried going up to see whether we had the bottom part of a substructure or the higher part of it, and started going up 
and you can see here the terrace is going up, or what was a very large pyramid. It goes up, uh, as far as we've traced it, eight stories high, and uh, each one of them curving back and going further up. What Agurcia found next was totally unexpected. There was yet a third structure inside the first two, but this one was different. The building Agurcia calls Rosalila was perfectly preserved. The loose dirt was removed, exposing a set of giant masks, still tinged with traces of the original paint. Most of the masks we found before were perhaps a meter or two tall and would extend as much as five, six meters. But uh, these masks just kept going and going and going. And to this moment, we still haven't found the end of them. Hey, partner. How's it going, boss? Oh. <laughs> you haven't been here in a while, have you? Wow. Whoa. <laughs> Can you believe this? Yeah, we got lots of good paint. Lord. We're coming down below the uh, molding, and we've got um, we've got two birds on him. Uh, we've got one over here on the left, and he's facing north. And I think we have another one. You see, he's, he's got his, his beak oh. bent over his eye. God. All the feathers behind. All him. the feathers radiating out. That's right. And also, oh. it's higher up than anything else in the Acropolis. So this thing shone out from miles around. Stick out a lot. It's outrageous. <laughs> it's just, just outrageous. Adorned with brightly painted sculpture, Rosa Lila once crowned the highest point in Copan. Framing the central doorway, two giant birds face the setting sun. Above them, undulating serpents extend their bodies toward the sky. For the archaeologists, the careful treatment given Rosalila poses a question. We're all just itching to know what Rosalila is all about. Why was it left there for 150 years and nobody touched it other than to maintain it? Why was it buried intact? They didn't touch any of it when they buried it. All the rest of them, they smashed to pieces to build something bigger and better over it. Why was it so revered that it had to be mummified when it was buried? And most of all, what's inside of it? What is that thing housing? And that's what we're hoping Ricardo will find. But before any new discoveries are made, the rainy season descends on Copan. The archaeologists return home, and all excavations are suspended until it ends. Nearly six months later, the rain is over. The weather clears. At last, the excavation of Temple 16 can be resumed. For another half year, workers continue to peel away the dirt from Rosalila. And just before the rains resume, the enigmatic temple yields one more surprise. From a small cache found in a doorway, Agurcia removes something buried 1,300 years ago. Look, it's a, it's a black kind of... Oh, man. It doesn't fit. It's close enough. You would not believe how sharp the edges on these things are. Look at the form. This is art, man. This isn't just some rocks they threw in here. This is really a powerful work of art. What they have found is a bundle of blades chipped from an especially sacred material. Flint, the Firestone. They were probably used on ceremonial occasions, and the faces may depict royal ancestors or sacrificial victims. No one knows how long it took to create these delicately flaked blades since no one today has the skill to make one.
In all, nine flints were found in Rosalila, perhaps corresponding to the nine Maya lords of the night. It's been here for 1,300 years, and it's, it's unbelievable. It's a beautiful piece of art. I mean, the, 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 the finesse, the work in it is, is incredible. And uh, I just feel like incredibly privileged, you know. You get caught up in the heat of the battle, and uh, you try not to forget to, uh, you know, take your pictures, take your measurements, and at times you forget to think about it and to think the fact that it's human beings that did this a long time ago, and that when they did it, uh, this was very important to them. And I'm, I'm touched by it. I really am. And it's a special feeling. It doesn't happen every day. It is likely that the flints of Gersia found in Rosalila were placed there sometime in the 7th century AD, when the classic Maya civilization was at its peak. In many Maya kingdoms, there was a boom in the construction of new buildings. Some cities were even connected by roads, and trade among them flourished. The treating myth events that take place in the Maya world that will eventually shake it to its core. Tikal was one of the greatest Maya cities, a prosperous urban center that was the envy of its neighbors. It was probably inconceivable to the kings of Tikal that any other kingdom posed a threat. But in the spring of 562, Karakol attacked Tikal and defeated it. During the upheaval that followed in Tikal, members of the royal family moved away into the jungle and established their own city. Today, a research base camp marks the spot. What was once the great city of Dos Pilas has again been reclaimed by the jungle. The effort to piece together a picture of its dramatic rise to power is being led by Arthur Demarest. What he has learned is changing the way we think about the Maya. Forty or fifty years ago, we thought of the Maya as this peace-loving, theocratic society, uh, these scholarly kings who studied the movements of the planets and lived kind of in a world of their own. Now we know from the recent hieroglyphic decipherments and from excavations like these that have found fortifications that uh, the Maya were a very violent people, one of the most warlike peoples of the New World and that they were constantly engaged in warfare, uh, battles of dynastic succession, and uh, earthly pursuits. In 1990, Demarest's team discovered concrete evidence to support oh, this view. It is a large, perfectly preserved hieroglyphic text, and on it, it talks about a series of wars, battles, and conquests involving the big players, Tikal, Dos Pilas, battling each other, and it records the outcomes. It's a tremendous piece of information, and its decipherment, I think, is going to change the way we look at this very critical period in Maya history. This is really amazing. They're saying that he is a subordinate of this lord, presumably of Kalak Mall. It's a critical title. <laughs> That's bad. That's amazing. Here we were competitive with Tikal. It's well, we have to think to about it. I mean, to is it subordination or...? Alliance. Epigraphers David Stewart and Steve Houston are called in to see how much of the text yeah, they can Lewis. read. Yeah. Between, uh, with references to Bonaparte and Tonyana. And then after that, X. 
Look, and there it's it is. Untuned. Yeah, this sartha refers to a kind of altar, and then it, here it refers to a dedication. It's referring to the stair. And look, it's a There's step. A stairway. A stair. It's a That's step. It's a pyramid. It's look. an actual. Okay, what it's saying is that this event, this this war event. And then over here you've got a new uh, event involving Ruri's father. The skull glyph here is the name of the ruler of Tikal. Initially, it seems that uh, Maya warfare was, to some extent, ritualized. It was more devoted to religious ends. Literally, these guys dressed up in, in silly outfits, uh, archaic costumes with big Paleolithic spears, and went out there and met in some place and knocked each other around. One of them was captured and brought back and sacrificed. What the hieroglyphs on the stairway seem to confirm is that sometime in the 8th century AD, ritualized warfare gave way to campaigns of expansion. The kings of Dos Pilas attacked towns along the Passion River and thereby seized control of a vital trade route. It looks like there was a change in warfare that led to an intensification and to a shifting to warfare for conquest actually absorbing the territory of others. This seems to have somehow gotten out of hand. An arms race, in a way, started. Attacking centers becomes acceptable. Attacking population bases, burning temples, that kind of thing. The new warfare would eventually come to Caracol as well. The 8th century and 9th century at Caracol and throughout the Maya era was a time of tremendous change and a lot of warfare. Caracol up to that point in time had been very successful in warfare. What happens, we think at least, is that in this late time horizon it's not just a question of defeating a neighboring civilization and taking them into your realm, but taking large numbers of captives to sacrifice and I think people were really scared. Picture yourself in a Maya city and here you've been having warfare and you say okay I'm gonna be captured and I'm gonna be put to work probably have to give three months out of the year to that foreign country over there but rather than that happening to you you've got this marauding army that comes in pulls all the men together and rather than marching them off to work into the fields they instead cut off their heads and mount them on sticks and make huge skull platforms. Now that would strike terror into you. That would be enough to say, my God, let's get out of here. Even Dos Pilas would finally face the terror. On the hieroglyphic stairway itself lie the ruins of a hastily erected stockade. Archaeologically, this defensive wall is one of the most important and exciting features that we've found here. One of the reasons why this masonry line is so neat and uh, is placed so well is that it's made out of neatly carved blocks which were ripped off. They're the facings from the palaces around you. So they literally tore down the royal palace and built this, running it up against their hieroglyphic stairway to create this, this desperate defensive system. A picture of the city in its final days begins to emerge. In a frantic attempt to keep the invaders out, the citizens of Dos Pilas erect two defensive walls around the center of the city and move inside for protection. These are low house platforms that held little huts that filled the central ceremonial plaza here at Dos Pilas at the time of the siege and the collapse. And it indicates that again the desperation of those final moments of this great kingdom was so great and its fall had been so complete that at this point you had the population living within the ceremonial plaza below the towering temples, below the monuments of the strutting great kings. It's almost as if you had a population squeezed in, living on the White House lawn, holding out at the very end of the collapse of American civilization. That's what you have here, that moment in time.
Copan, meanwhile, is struggling with problems of a different sort. When one of its most powerful rulers is captured and beheaded, faith in the divine authority of the kings wavers. At the same time, the population in the Copan Valley continues to grow. Basically, the Copanecs became victims of their own success. And as this city grew and became more vibrant and more attractive, eventually all of this nice, fertile alluvial bottomland was covered by houses. And they were basically cutting themselves off from their own food source. As time went by, all of the forest was eliminated. This caused wide-scale erosion throughout the valley. This eventually resulted in less rainfall, and people just weren't able to live here anymore. It is now the middle of the 8th century. Throughout the southern Maya world, the power of the kings is waning. Disease and hunger are becoming commonplace. People begin to drift away from the cities. In Europe, the dark ages are halfway over. Here, in the jungle, they are just beginning. Slowly, one by one, the great southern cities are abandoned. In 761, the king of Dos Pilas is captured and killed. From that point on, there are no more hieroglyphic inscriptions here. The last written date at Palenque is 799. Twenty years later, Copan falls silent. Caracol stops recording in 859. The last inscription date at Tikal is written in 879. Only a handful of Maya cities in the south survive beyond the first years of the 10th century. The northern cities of the Yucatan Peninsula, places like Uxmal and Chichen Itza, will prosper for several hundred years longer. But they are no longer ruled by divine kings. And gradually, the old ways of building and writing and worshiping slip away. The classic Maya civilization is at an end. One of the things I think that strikes the public consciousness about the Maya civilization is to see this sophisticated culture with its monuments and architecture and science and writing system in the jungle, covered, destroyed, an area that's now abandoned today. I think that there's an immediate impact when you see that. It reminds us that we can fail, that civilization is a complex phenomena and we can screw up and the consequences can be totally catastrophic. Yet, while the classic Maya civilization may have disappeared, the Maya people have not. For 3,000 years they have survived the ambitions of their own kings and those of foreign conquerors. And once again, they are under assault.
In Guatemala, during the past three decades, the Maya have been caught in a civil war they barely comprehend. In that time, 100,000 Maya have been killed and another 40,000 have disappeared. No one can count the number of widows and orphans. And through it all, they endure. They weave their wheepeels. They farm their corn. I feel that the Maya of today are very much in the same traditions as the classic Maya. What they've lost is that big covering, that overlay of nobility. And they dropped it themselves. They basically told the kings, that's it, you're not working anymore, and they went in to continue their own lives. I don't like it when people talk about the Maya collapse, because they never collapse. They evolved, they went through different hard times, good times, bad times, but they're still with us. They still maintain their customs, they still maintain their ways of organizing their societies. And it's very exciting to see how much of the ancient Maya way of life is still alive and well. Well, what we're digging up, what we're coming up with, it's just part of our history. And the men that lived here are some of the greatest men we've ever had. And it's the fact that we're getting to know more and more and more about the life of these people, more than I ever thought was possible. I think if somebody had asked me as a graduate student whether we would know what we know today about the Maya at Copan, there's no way I would have believed them. What is happening now is the people who made these places, people like Yashpak or Bird Jaguar or Pakal, are getting back their voices. They are becoming real to us and speaking to the people of the 20th century about who built this place and why and what they felt and what they thought about the world. These are not anonymous people anymore.